All right. So um, a long time ago, there used to be a computer vision king that lived in the kingdom of the clouds in a very humble house, such as this one. Thanks, Dali. Um, so how did he get there? Well, he was doing deep learning and then almost overnight, he had a skyrocketing career and therefore ended up in the clouds. He lived a very happy life there until he realized that his vision was slowly becoming worse. It was becoming very cloudy. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Okay. <laughs> he felt very sad. And so he wanted to give all of his knowledge to his only child. He started with backprop, but quickly realized that without having a pen and paper up there, this was a futile attempt, way too difficult. So instead, he started teaching his child the ImageNet 12 classes, as of course one always would do, right? And so they looked around, and when they found a cloud, such as this one, the king would tell his son, oh, this is uh, ImageNet, WordNet ID, N0232 or what the peasants call a wood rabbit. And he did this while remembering how he learned it with the original images, um, beautiful RGB images. Um, and sometimes they had to wait a bit, but always new clouds would emerge and learning would continue. And sometimes he had to get a bit creative, you know, like when you explain things like someone hasn't seen, like this thing has a horn like a rhinoceros and the body of a horse. If you're trying to explain a, a, a unicorn, this is sort of kind of how he explained, tried to explain some other classes. And this king would sometimes get sentimental, never sure whether his son would actually be able to imagine the true beauty of ImageNet, but he kept on going and going. And it is said that he succeeded so well that when his child eventually came back to earth, the child became a famous computer vision professor and is apparently somewhere in Oxford. <laughs> so that's sort of the happy end of the fairy tale. And at the same time, the start of critical thinking, right? So what we want to know is, like, how would the son or the child ever learn the famous dishwasher class or even more famous Tinker Tinker class, right? Like, surely there aren't clouds that look like this. Um, so how can we test this fairy tale? How can we test it? So, of course, if we want to test it as a computer vision researcher, the king is the pre-trained neural network. That's the teacher. And the student is the, the son, um, the randomly initialized neural network. Doesn't know anything. And instead of having them live in this cloud world, we just let them live in a single image. And what they're looking at is different parts of the image, maybe with some augmentation. So you crop it, and you apply some rotations, maybe some uh, shears on top of it. And so that's what they're looking at. And then the question is, after the teacher has trained the student in this manner, can the student correctly classify the validation sets of data sets like ImageNet, Kinetics, UCF? All right, so this is how we could try test this fairy tale. Now, let me tell you about the motivation behind this research question. The idea that we commonly use in computer vision, and maybe the supervisor has also drawn this at some point on the, on the whiteboard, is that the natural images lie in some sort of ideal lower dimensional manifold. So the swans might be here, dogs might be there, different kind of well, cats might be there, different kinds of dogs might be here, and so on, if you're thinking about the ImageNet classes. And now a single image, of course, is a real image, so it's somewhere on this manifold. Let's say it would be somewhere there. And if you apply a ton of augmentations, these augmentations would be somewhere in the vicinity of this image. So the research question we're trying to figure out is, can you extrapolate from this single image to all of these semantic categories? And this is the question that we wanted to tackle in this paper. And before I tell you that it works, again, I'm going to tell you why it might work, first of all. So if you consider the space of all possible images, or even just a slightly smaller space, all possible images with RGB values that are between 0 and 255 of size 224 by 224 for three channels, that's times three. This is a huge space. And most of this, most of the instantiations in this space are garbage pictures. They don't mean anything. So if our earlier hypothesis is true, the space of all natural images is sort of this lower dimensional manifold up there. And then a single image would be, and its augmentations would be there. And so the, what we call the augmented image prior hypothesis is the following, that within the space of all possible images I, a single real image and its augmentations provide a very informative prior 
about all real images for extrapolation. So this is sort of the visual motivation. Now, how, how do we test this? I've already mentioned it a bit, that we want to use a teacher and a student. And it will work as follows. We start off with this single image that we have them live in. We test a bunch of images, uh, come to that. And then you augment it heavily. So you take a bunch of crops. We actually save a million of them. Um, and then we apply strong augmentations during training. And then we feed them through a pre-trained teacher that was trained on a data set. And this pre-trained teacher then imagines all of these ImageNet classes, right? So it, it doesn't see, for example, a goldfish, but there will be a non-negligible non -negligible probability of outputting some number for goldfish and so on. And then the student will only be seeing the same sort of uh, input data that the pre-trained te te teacher is seeing now and will try to imitate these probabilities. So what you get at the end is a trained student that has never seen real images apart from these fake and heavily augmented ones. Um, and then we take the student and test it on real, on the real validation set of ImageNet, for example. Now, the training data basically looks as follows. These are the inputs, right? The images with some heavy augmentations like cut mix and so on. And these are sort of the teacher's output probabilities, the pre-trained teacher. So again, this is not a work that's about self-supervised learning, but this is a work about supervised learning. So the teacher is trained. Uh, we just take off the shelf trained teachers. And the teacher, for example, in this case, uh, hallucinates uh, seeing a packet in the top left one or a nail in the bottom left one and a slide rule in the bottom right one, um, which takes some creativity. Um, but OK, uh, it, it gets even funnier because with one image, we can sort of make fake videos by simply taking two crops and smoothly interpolating between them. You get these sort of fake videos, which are clearly not videos, but they're good enough for inputting them into a video backbone like S3D or X3D. And then if you put them through a model that was pre-trained on, on kinetics, so all these 400 action categories, you get these sort of uh, uh, outputs. So it, the teacher is extremely sure that this model, uh, this video is depicting the action of playing bagpipes. And with this one, if you want to take any guesses, it's uh, reading newspapers of course right and yeah so it's really hard to tell it really doesn't make a lot, whole lot of sense but this is this is all the training data i mean a subset but this is all you have you have your input data and you have the thing that you're trying to match at the end so let's take a look at the results so first of all what we show is okay if you not use a single image, but if you use proper data sets for distillation, right? So in this case, on the left-hand side, Cypher 10, you want to uh, distill a model, you want to train a student model using Cypher 10 as a data set, that's a green bar. So then you get the best performance, of course. If you use Cypher 100, instead, you're getting a very slight drop because already Cypher 10 and Cypher 100 has like some slight uh, change in distribution. Similar for Cypher 100, the best number you get if you use the original data set. Now, if you simply use 20% of Cypher 10, you get some decrease in both cases. Um, and in, in the number of uh, in the brackets, I've written the number of pixels. So with 20% of Cypher 10, you're still at 10 million pixels. Um, however, our single image is just 2.8 million pixels. And indeed, if we use that and simply apply it through the same procedure, you simply take our single image, uh, save 32 by 32 sized crops, 50,000 of them down on your hard drive, and then you apply the same stuff as we were doing here, you get much better performance than even 20% of Cypher 10. So this was quite encouraging. Um, so we started analyzing some more pictures. These pictures uh, contain all sorts of things. They're just images from ImageNet. And we ran them through the same procedure now, uh, simply taking crops of it and saving them as a data set. And here you can see that the accuracy rough uh, goes up from going from bottom le top left to bottom right. And actually what you can see is that the accuracy sort of correlates with the size and megabytes of the JPEG compression, which is sort of the, the, the complexity of the image, if you will, in one way or another. This line does not ring true at all if you take a random image, for example. Random images are very hard to compress with JPEG or not compressible at all. Um, yet they do not work at all. So they would be all the way to the right, but all the way at the bottom in terms of accuracy. So 
this line seems to be true for natural images, more or less. Um, and of course, this line will also depend on whether you're testing for Cypher 100 or other data sets. Now we get some really cool results when we scale this to ImageNet. Um, and we can vary the student and teacher architectures. So in this case, our teacher is a ResNet 18. That's sort of the gray dashed line at the top, which has 69% top one accuracy on ImageNet validation set. And now we can uh, vary, for example, the width of a ResNet. That's a blue line. And we can see that if we vary the width and make the student model bigger and wider, we can basically reach the teacher's performance of 69% uh, on uh, ImageNet. So what this means is the student only having seen these crappy augmentations, and then you apply it on ImageNet validation set, it gets it as correct as the pre-trained teacher, which is kind of cool. And you can also see that increasing the width is much more important than increasing the depth in this case. Um, you get these curves. So the blue curve is sort of what I've shown you here. And in this case, the x-axis is training epochs. And the blue one at the top is ResNet 18 as a teacher and ResNet 15 as a student, uh, ResNet 50 as, as a student, where you end up at this sort of high performance. Um, if you instead use a better teacher, a ResNet 50 as a teacher, you end up at the line below. So if you use a better teacher, suddenly your student becomes worse. And this is quite different from normal knowledge distillation, where of course, if you use a better teacher, your student would be better. Um, so this is quite, quite a funny thing. Um, we can talk about the reasons later, um, but just to note that one here. Same, of course, if you use a ResNet 50 to ResNet 18, it's even worse. And if you use an image that's just random noise, um, you basically stick at 0% performance. And the same is true if you simply apply new noise at every batch. We've tried uniform noise, caution noise, doesn't matter, it doesn't work. Um, so there really is something about a real image. Um, and we uh, also have varied a couple of more images. So not just this one image and not just those 12 images for Cypher 10, but we've tried for ImageNet, we've tried, I think, five or eight images as well. Um, right. Uh, actually, you don't need even the full output. So you can also just use knowledge distillation with the top five or even with ArcMax. With ArcMax, um, for ImageNet, you still get something like 48% top one accuracy, which is pretty crazy because with ArcMax, you have certainly some classes which will never be predicted by the uh, teacher, um, but it still works. And of course, like this is quite, quite a point for for API providers, which of course don't give you the whole distribution for the for their proprietary model, but just give you like, for example, top five predictions or just say, I'm seeing a chair. And with that information, you could already steal the model. Um, even if your data set that you use for stealing the model is just a single image. And we're not the first one that have some something like that. So there was Oricon Lee at all that did something similar um, that you can steal models basically. And funnily enough, we tried how it works on kinetics and, uh, and UCF. And it's not quite as good as a teacher in this case. We didn't try it that hard because it takes quite some time to, to run video models. Um, but all of these runs are basically 200 epochs, 200 epochs on ImageNet, 200 epochs on kinetics. Um, and you still get 52% top one accuracy on a classification data set of videos. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty decent. You can also generalize this to audio. You simply apply uh, not color jitter or rotations as noise, but uh, augmentations in the audio space, like adding some random noise and, and pitch shifts and stuff like that. And here we also get like decent performance. In this case, for example, Libre speech, no, uh, which one? Uh, speech commands of Oxford, I think they're classification to 100 classes. And so getting 84% top one accuracy is not too bad. Um, this is sort of a, visualization of the embedding space. Um, in this case, what you can see, it's a TSNE plot of uh, embedding the random patches and the Cypher 10 test set instances. So the Cypher 10 test set instances ha have this X. These are the real images. And the patches have dots, are uh, represented with dots. Um, what you can see, despite the some examples that we've shown here, is that most training images are contained within a small region of the network in the center. Um, 
and the network needs to extrapolate for the real images that it has never seen, which occupy the outer regions of this plot. Now, we cannot really say extrapolate or outside or inside because it's a T-SNE plot, but you can pretty much, this is definitely a pattern, right? You can see all the axes are somewhat outside of the distribution. Um, qualitative analysis one, qualitative analysis two, you take your student model and then you do activ activation maximization on the trained model. So in this case, we compared against the teacher. So on the top side, you take the harp neuron, which should activate most of them, if there's an image of a harp, and you do activation maximization. So you figure out which image would activate this neuron the most. And you do the same thing for the model that has never seen a harp, and it looks pretty much the same. Again, same thing for monarch butterfly. It's never seen a butterfly in its life, but it has a really good sort of mental model of what a butterfly is. Um, same for the panda. Actually, I, I like the one from the one image much better than the one from ImageNet pre-trained um, and so on and so forth. So it can, it has a pretty good image of what an altar looks like or what a pretzel looks like, despite it having only seen this one city image, um, which is really interesting. All right, so some concluding remarks. Fairy tales are great. Of course, we came up with the fairy tale only after, after we've done the research, but still. Um, I want to propose one argument of why it might work, which is the following. Um, Left-hand side, you can see this data set that we've created. On the right-hand side, you can see a data set or a screenshot of a data set of, um, of babies that had head cams mounted, babies in their stage where the vision is developing very rapidly. And you can then take these two data sets and you can compute some measures on the data set. Um, Namely, you can figure out how correlated they are with the gist distances, and you get these sort of plots. So for the toddler data, sort of the mean gist distance between the images is somewhere between 0. Point, well, let's say 0. 0.23 or something. For us, it's 0. 0.25. Now, this doesn't mean that much, but if you then compare the same distance on ImageNet instead, you can see that for ImageNet, it's somewhere like 0. 0.75 or something. So what this means is that our data set is much closer to this, what like these toddlers at that stage of their development circle uh, are looking at. So perhaps there's something quite useful about heavily, heavily correlated data to develop these initial uh, edge detector and very basic pattern recognition systems. Um, we also show that you can actually use a single image for pruning and quantization of pre-trained models. It's table 16 in the appendix, if you, if you want to know. Um, thinking about also being able to apply to medical imaging, where sometimes you actually don't have large data sets, but you have, for example, one huge image. Um, so sort of it's fun and fundamental research, um, but it def definitely does have some potential applications. Um, this work finally got accepted to iClear 2023. Um, you can ask me all about the funniest and most annoying reviewer two comments that this paper has gotten on its way there, but yeah, glad glad it's accepted now.